<laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Alaska Photographic Center's Tuesday monthly meeting. Uh, this is the last, our last meeting, our, our last guest lecture slide talk of this season. Um, we start again uh, with with our, our monthly talks in September. Um, so, uh, and you'll see some, you know, you'll see our announcements uh, closer to uh, um, in September for who we have lined up for that one. Um, let me uh, jump to a couple of announcements. Uh, I just want to mention um, Rarified Light uh, 2023. The call is open. And um, let's see. The call closes on June 7th at 10 p.m. Alaska Standard Time. So um, you can go on uh, Cafe and, uh, and do your entries from the Cafe site. Um, on July 13th, uh, we'll have the juror lecture. And our juror is Jennifer Spellman. And uh, that'll be July 13th at 7 p.m. Uh, her her lecture her slide talk will be called photographing Cuba and, and it's also on Zoom and then we have a, a workshop July 14th 15th and 16th and the workshop is on the contemporary zine and it is a vir virtual uh, workshop so um, I believe there's still spaces open. So uh, contact us if you are interested in, in joining the workshop. So at this point, I can go ahead and introduce tonight's talk, uh, Jenny Irene Miller. Um, she's, uh, she's joining us from Homer, Alaska. She's at a, 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 an artist in residency right now at the Bunnell Street Art Center. And um, Jenny Irene Miller is Inupiaq, born in Nome, Alaska. She's an artist working primarily with photography, and her work focuses on identity, community, place, refusal, and access. Uh, Jenny lives and works on Dena'aina El, El Nanya in Anchorage, Alaska. Um, she holds an MFA in photography from the University of New Mexico, in Albuquerque, where she was awarded the Beaumont Newhall Van Deren Koch Photography Fellowship. She also holds a BFA in photo media and a BA in American Indian Studies from the University of Washington. She's a past site Santa Fe scholar, Elizabeth Ferber Fellow, and Fulbright Canada Killam Fellow. So uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jenny and uh, uh, and I'm just going to probably leave my video off as I'll pop it on for a second to say hi, everyone. Um, thank you for being here today and for sharing your time with me today. And thank you to everyone at the Alaska Photographic Center for organizing the Photo Tuesday Artist Talk series and for this opportunity to share more about my work. And thank you, Mike Conti, for reaching out and inviting me. My name is Jenny. I'm an artist who primarily works with the medium of photography. My larger portfolio also includes works made with video, sound, sculpture, and more recently, a photo book. And Mike may have shared this, but my uh, art practice is grounded in all of this. Place, storytelling, indigeneity, queerness, and familial and community relations. I am inspired by kinship, home, and our stories. This allows me to further understand my knowledge of self and ways of knowing that have been instilled in me by my family and culture. And experiences, sorry. Today's talk will include an overview of a selection of past and current work and an introduction to who I am and where I come from. The circumpolar region is what we Inuit call home. We continue to live in our homelands in the empires of the United States, in Alaska, Canada, Greenland, Russia, and beyond. 
I'm from Nome and come from the Inupiaq of Northwest Alaska. This map illustrates the many indigenous place names that the previous map does not include. This region was and is still home to many unique Alaska Native peoples. I like to start off all of my talks with a recognition of place and where I come from. Place plays an important role in who I am and what my work is about. If I could boil down my work to one word, it would be home. Home is made up of community, family, non-human kin, and so much more. It's important for me to ground my viewers and audience in where I come from so that perhaps those viewers who are not part of my culture or familiar with where I come from may look at my work with a more informed perspective to the work. I see my work as a form of visual sovereignty. Visual sovereignty, as Dr. Drew says, and I quote, is one of the most dominant expressions of self-determination. Just as my Inupiaq ancestors' were for, identities were formed, my identity is shaped by the lands and the waters that we come from. I am King Kmute, which translates to the people of Kinnigan. Who I am is formed by my relations to kin, to the land, the ocean, my family, the community I come from, and those who I love. This photograph is an image I made during my first visit to Kinnigan, the village of my maternal family roots nine miles northwest of Nome. My fascination with the photograph began at a young age. In 1994, after my great grandma passed away, I inherited her Polaroid camera. This was when I began to form a strong in looking at photographs and making snapshot images of the people and the places in my life, as well as the mundane activities I did deemed important as a child. It was around this time that my enchantment with our family's archive also began. I see photography as a magic medium. Photography as a medium still has that magical quality to it that draws me in and allows me to spend more time with a particular subject, theme, or memory. Photography provides a space for me to practice a form of careful observation that runs deep in the Inupiaq culture that I come from. These images are my first self-portraits from 1996, who I directed to click the shutter. It's a silly story of taking a bath and getting ready for bed made by kids. The next slides contain a selection of work I made during my last couple years of undergrad at the University of Washington. This work is called the Duwamish River and was made in 2011 on the land and Duwamish people, the original peoples of Seattle. As an Inupiaq person, I come from water peoples. So everywhere I live, I'm looking for water, observing the water and trying to learn more about it. It's a way for me to form a connection to place. These images portray the natural yet urban environment and restoration areas of the river and snippets of the surrounding neighborhood. While living in Seattle, I was learning more about the river and first came to know this river by following it from the headwaters in the mountains to the tidewaters. At that time, I a bike to get around. I couldn't travel again to the headwaters after that initial visit. I then decided to spend more time at the tidewaters of the Duwamish River and make images there as well as on the river. Today, the Duwamish River is much different than what it used to be. The once meandering river was altered and straightened in 1913 by the Army Corps of Engineers. The natural channels were modified for a deeper, straighter body of water to enable ships to steer through, allowing industry to drastically alter this river. In 2001, the Duwamish River was listed as a federal Superfund site.
a conversation with me in a new pack. Sorry. A conversation with me in a new pack from 2013, comments on language suppression through external forces organized by the US federal government, such as missionaries, boarding schools, and other assimilation tactics. In this video, I remain silent because I cannot speak my language. It is shot in a church as Christianity has played a significant role in the suppression of our language. Important for me to share this older work because language plays a role in the work I'm making today through titles or thinking about the visual language of photography or my attempts to include my own voice through handwriting, which we will see later. That's not Quack, How Did We Get Here is a three channel video. When making this piece, I was interested in food sovereignty and how our Inupiaq identity is tied to our foods, to the lands and the waters our foods come from. Around this time, I was thinking about my relationship to traditional foods such as muktuk seal and other forms of quok, and how I wasn't able to access that food when I was away from my home community, and how my tastes were changing as I moved further and further away from Northwest Alaska. This video is also the first piece where I began to experiment with the visual cues, with visual cues that perhaps many in fact people would recognize and relate to. That is the dull and mass produced ulu my cousin cuts the chicken with and the cardboard she cuts the chicken on. Cardboard, which we use back home to cut our foods on, which are often sea mammals, can be too large for a normal cutting board. And then mammals have strong scents. Therefore, cardboard provides a cutting board that can be easily beat easily be disposed of. This is also the first time I began to experiment with the concept of learning through observation, which is culturally significant. As in Nupak, we are taught to learn from watching, learn by doing. Taking this customary act of, act of learning through observation, my cousin Andy Fay in the back viewed a video on YouTube on how to cut a chicken. She then portioned out the whole 699 rotisserie chicken for us to eat using a mass produced ulu not made by our peoples, a mimic of a traditional Inuit knife. That's not quack, how did we get here? Comments on the switch from nutrient rich traditional foods to easy to access store bought foods. Our traditional foods are integral to our culture and identity. Food defines who we are and connects us to our ancestors. So how did we get here? Continuous is a project that I started in 2015 after wanting to see more indigenous queer representation that was made by us and featured us and really my desire to connect with other queer native folks. In 2015, there also weren't many conversations going on publicly about what it means to be indigenous and queer and how to decolonize gender and sexuality. Continuous is my small inquiry into that work. During this time, I was also thinking a lot about my own story and youth and how I wish I would have had an indigenous queer adult to reach out to, to talk to and connect with as a person coming to know myself as queer. Continuous features portraits of indigenous LGBTQ plus and two spirit peoples, which are accompanied by short stories from each participant. Continuous centers indigenous queer peoples and our stories and acknowledges that heteropatriarchy and heteronormativity are part of the colonial project and the US empire. This is an example of one story which Mariah shared. I've known Mariah since childhood, so it was really special to have her as part of this work. And I'll just pause here for a minute for folks to um, take a sneak, at, sneak peek at Mariah's story.
My hope is that Continuous will continue to inspire a dialogue within our communities so that they be, can become more welcome and safe for Indigenous queer kin to flourish. If you're interested in this work, a selection of the portraits and stories can be found on my website at jennyirenemiller.com. These are a few of the last images I got to make uh, with my mom prior to leaving Alaska for graduate school in 2019. Over the years and really since high school, I've always made photographs of my mom. This session was especially tender and hard. It was tough to leave Alaska knowing my mom had an aggressive form of cancer and would be going into her last round of chemotherapy while my partner and I and our dog made our drive from Anchorage to Albuquerque. The good news is my mom is cancer free today and we both look back at these images as visual references of strength and what she has overcome. So this brings me to Albuquerque. Being new to Albuquerque and far from home and not initially having a community there caused me to think hard. And it took me a while to make work that became something. So I began to think about how to bring stories from home forward and new work while not having immediate access to home or community. This caused me to explore other modes of making such as small form sculptures. My Grammy's dialect working title from 2019 is a small scale sculpture carved from ivory brand soap in the form of a human tongue that comes out of the wall at roughly the height my late grandma would have been when she was abused in school for speaking her language. While I was in elementary school, Inupiaq master carvers were invited to our school to teach us about the medium of walrus tusk carving. Because walrus tusk because ivory soap is much more affordable and accessible than walrus ivory, we were taught to carve soap to mimic the tradition of ivory carving. My Grammy's dialect references one means by which the Inupiaq language has been suppressed in Inupiaq communities, as well as other indigenous communities, through the washing of one's mouth with soap for speaking their language. Thinking about language and having conversations with kin who have passed through my work continues to come forward. This image, looking for my language in the corner where my Grammy was forced to leave it, was made in 2019. I was never satisfied with this image, no matter how many times I tried to remake it. It remains a sketch. Since that previous image never felt quite finished, I returned to the space of the corner in the fall of 2021. This iteration of working in the corner refer references my view of home, of personal memories, of my late great grandma's living room and so many homes in Northwest Alaska through, through the layouts of the works. I have been thinking about how many photographs of loved ones were displayed on the walls of elders' homes in Alaska. Frames of all sizes graced the walls featuring kin. Portraits were layered through small acts of safekeeping by tucking frameless photographs into the corners of the frame where the glass and the wood met. This work in progress is inspired by those modest yet significant gestures of keeping loved ones close, as I remember from childhood. I have obscured some of the faces in the archival images as an act of protection, similar to my other work. This idea of activating the corner and it being a site of coming together is of interest to me. It's a space that I've been thinking about since 2019, as you just saw in the previous slides. The corner can also reference a triangle, which is another coded visual language found in our tattooing. At the time of making this, I was still navigating this mode of working and what this piece would become, or what works this mode of production can and will transform into. So I 
I feel like I found a solution, which is a new sculpture piece I made in 2020. 2022 made out of my late great grandma's handwriting, which was part of my MFA, MFA thesis work where the tundra meets the ocean. And before I get to talking about where the tundra meets the ocean, I want to talk about this photo. This image has been an important reference point for me in my current art practice. My great grandma's fancy fur parka found in our family's photographs contains layers of information beyond a simple and uninformed read of the garment. Our Inupiaq clothing includes signals and information about the wear through pattern, cut, and abstract designs that silently communicate who they are, their gender, and what community they are of. Today, these designs remind of us, remind us who we come from. Our, cl our clothing is tied to place. And our clothing has also been used for protection from the harsh climate we come from. I've been trying to figure out how to incorporate our abstract designs that are thousands of years old into my work and to translate this idea of protection in a new way. I see this notion of protection showing up in my work in the form of refusal. To refuse is to exercise extraordinary power. I do this because as a new black person, many of our stories have been told by people outside of our communities, which can be dangerous. In that process, our stories have become disconnected from us and do not represent me. They exist as stereotypes and remain in the past. I've been thinking about the power I hold as an artist, especially when photo-based works are created and how much information I choose to give the viewer and how much to keep for myself. And I am thinking about how the refusal of information can, when I feel it is necessary, protect the person or non-human kin being photographed or visualized. When I employ this strategy can enact a form of tension. It requires a close read of the work. Ultimately, who has access to all of that information? And what does that refusal do to the viewer? Does it cause discomfort or curiosity? During the time of this video, I was reading work by Deborah Bird and thinking about indigenous refusal. As Deborah Bird has highlighted, and I quote, to get in the way of settler colonization, all the native person has to do is stay home, end of quote. What I learned from Bird and other indigenous scholars is that indigenous peoples and specifically queer indigenous folks are a threat to the empire simply through our existence. This threat is found within our refusal of the US empire's queer phobic, transphobic and patriarchal principles. Standing our ground and taking up place, taking up space as indigenous peoples gets in the way of settler colonialism and is indigenous refusal. Indigenous refusal has become an important theory to my work. In Self Portrait Legs 2020, I've directed the focus of my lens onto myself again. This portrait is about queerness and my identity as a whole. While making this image, I was thinking about the following. What does it mean to be fem feminine? What does it mean to be masculine? What about a little bit of both? Who gets to decide? This piece utilizes deadpan humor and pokes one of the pervasive standards of mainstream American culture cleanliness and beauty, the dangers of a gender binary, and made up rules around who should and should not shave their legs. Untitled 2020, after Hal Fisher, is a standalone piece from a stage in my practice where I began to experiment with language in a new way to me through the inclusion of handwritten text. 
This photograph is a way for me to celebrate the close practice of Inuit tattooing. The artists found back home who have given me these tattoos and the artists who have made the pieces of jewelry that I choose to adorn myself with. In April, 2021, I was finally able to go back home for the first time since leaving for grad school in 2019 due to the pandemic to visit my mom. During that visit, I made images of my mom, my auntie, my mom's scars from her chemotherapy port, scans of the port, and began to think more about my family's archive and how those images from the past act as portals and connect me to my kin who have passed through space and time. I'm still figuring out this work specifically that's beginning to tell the story of my mom's cancer battle and trying to find ways to integrate it with uh, my late great grandpa's cancer battle to which he lost his life to. I feel it's an important story to place in this ever-growing archive I'm adding to with my work for future in back to look at. This brings me to my more current and ongoing work, which was also my recent MFA thesis this time of last year. Where the Tender Meets the Ocean rendered family through photographs and the reactivation of familial archival images and documents. This ongoing work centers on Inupiaq and queer quiet moments and memory an intergenerational dialogue between myself, family members, and those who have passed. This work features the strong women in my life, soft moments found at home with my partner, and the spaces and memories where I find comfort. These photographs help me keep those in my family who have passed alive and my kin nearby. Moments highlighted in Where the Tender Meets the Ocean, such as in this photograph, Tea with Aka, is a conversation I'm having with my late great grandma over tea. The photograph features her teacup and saucer. Through objects such as the teacup and by including myself through the shadow of the hand, this story serves as an act of remembering her. This process also allows me to keep her close to me and not forgotten. In my art practice, I have been asking myself, how do I keep someone alive who has passed on and how do I make photographs of them today? Working with my family archive and building my personal archive, a form of visual remembrance and directly links the past to the future. It is a way for me to share traces of my family legacies. In the back, use oral storytelling to import knowledge share lessons, and keep one another alive. Native feminism also teaches us that storytelling and the act of remembering as methods to keep people who no longer exist in this realm alive. My work aligns with these concepts. In this image, Mom, Aka, and Grammy, my mom holds an archival photograph that features my Aka and my late Grammy. This image is about generational strength, love, and indigenous joy. Again, I wanted to include important family members who have passed on in this work. For the past 10 years plus, I've had so many questions I've wanted to ask my late great grandma and my late grandma.
The color palette in my work relates to home to Northwest Alaska. Well, a good portion of these images were made in Alaska. A large number were also made in New Mexico and beyond. The pandemic kept me from returning home as much as I would have liked, but I found it a great challenge to make work about home while being away. The sometimes soft light renders the subject matter in a similar quality of light that would be found back home in Alaska during the winter months. The energetic light in others could be found on a summer day where the midnight sun shines. Where the tender meets the ocean contains poetic whispers of kin, which ask the viewers to slow down to engage with the stillness in the photographs. The viewing of this work is not to be rushed, which relates to Inupiaq concepts of time, observation as a key learning method, and the value of patience in my culture. Aka's tender note, new fur, is a scan of an archival family photograph with my late Aka's handwritten note. This image to me speaks to love, care, what is not only on the inside of the frame, but what is outside of the frame. While reading this note, I felt the love that my late great grandparents shared for each other. I felt sadness, but above all, I felt a connection to them more through this note than what was on the reverse side. I've been thinking about access and the access one has to, to histories, to stories in my work. And I've been thinking about the unseen in this piece. This note can have multiple reads. I feel the sense of love and pride Willie, a skilled hunter and provider, presented his wife Helen with a new fur. Helen was a skilled skin sewer and seamstress. This wolverine was most likely turned into the sunshine rough on our fancy fur park found in the archival photographs. Sunshine roughs are a staple in Inupak parka making. This read of mine differs from even a read I had by another person who could only focus on the word kill, killed. This piece about tender love and those who come from my community will recognize this. Where the tender meets the ocean is a space I've been thinking about in my practice, especially when the pandemic started and returning home was more difficult while living in New Mexico for graduate school. It was a place I was traveling to through my work and family archival photographs and documents. The following slides feature documentation photographs of a sequence of Where the Tundra Meets the Ocean, which exhibited at the John Summers Gallery in Albuquerque in April 2022. 
I chose to print my photographs large for this show because I want my to center in new back and queer stories. Each of the four large 48 by 32 inch images that you just saw contain one small hand-drawn unique design that is relevant to my culture. These abstract designs are simple at first glance, yet contain layers of information and are thousands of years old. Our Inupiaq ancestors adorned almost everything they made from clothing to hunting devices with designs. Again, these abstract designs silently communicate who and where someone comes from. Our designs can also mark important milestones in one's life. I wanted to make my own frames from scratch so that I could etch designs into the frames as an act of protection, adornment, and for the visual symbols to act as a small gift to those who look. Each design is specific to the image it corresponds to, and each design was initially hand-drawn, and then digitized and then um, etched in with a CNC before the frames were assembled. This note came to life or this piece came to life for me, continuing to think about that space of the corner, which I referred to earlier in the stock of language and how to reclaim that space that I was originally looking at as a space of language loss. Here in my great grandma's handwriting and note detail from 1989 activates the corner. Her story continues with me in my work and those who are also connected to her. To me, the sheet metal references the graphite of the pencil she originally used to write this story down with. And here's an image to kind of give the scale of, of the piece. The interconnectedness of the photographs I have made and the reactivation of the family archive thread us together and visually presents closeness in a larger conversation between my loved ones and I. This work highlights intergenerational knowledge of history of identity. I also made this photo book, which contains the larger sequence of this work to accompany my thesis exhibition. The photo book contains 38 photos, 78 pages total, and is 10 and a half by eight inches. An addition of 75 were printed last year. So what am I working on now? I'm slowly getting back to, into my art practice post MFA. I'm regrounding myself in Alaska since moving back. 
And I'm continuing to think about poetics and imagery, quiet moments, my own archive that I'm creating each time I make photographs and photographing those who I admire as a celebration of them. This is an image I made of my dear friend Quinn, someone who I've had the privilege of photographing over the years and hopefully will be able to continue to make work with. I've been thinking about how I'd like my images to be accessed and viewed by future Indigenous and queer folks when I'm gone. I've been thinking about my images made today as a small gift to future generations. That's because I'm so thankful to be able to look through archival photographs of others and to feel a connection to my ancestors, family, and other queer folks through works of Catherine Opie and Laura Aguilar, to name a few. And now I'm here in Homer on a three week artist residency at the Bunnell Street Art Center. Beach Sky is an image I made my second day in Homer. And I'm thrilled and grateful to be here and for this dedicated time to my art practice. I'm still thinking about water, my connection to place, and how the image as a portal and connect people across time and space. Here are a couple documentation photographs of my studio wall at Bunnell Street Art Center. My goal here has been to work on a garment project I set aside. I'm working with familial with the family archive the cyanotype photographic process and have reopened a project I started in the spring of 2020 in Albuquerque, but put away until my residency here. This work in progress is in the beginning stages of a garment, a cuspuck, composed of my late great grandma's hands, cropped and lifted from arch archival family photographs. Here I'm thinking about and support connection and queerness. I'm in the stage of converting the hands into negatives to begin experimenting with printing the hands on fabric with the cyanotype photographic printing process. I'm going to give myself time with this project and continue to make sure my art practice has joy in the making process. Joy and experimentation are two themes I've been thinking more deeply as being important to my art practice. I also wanted to share this work in progress and sketch. This current iteration is a step forward from a sketch I made in my studio in Albuquerque in the fall of 2021. I've circled back to this sketch during my residency. What you see here is a scanned family Polaroid photo printed on copy paper as a working print with the verso side visible with a handwritten with handwriting on the left side. And as you can see in the right documentation photo, the image is pinned in the front of the, of the image of the Polaroid side, only revealing, sorry, uh, the image is pinned in the front of the image side of the Polaroid, only revealing minimal graphic information to the viewer. In this install, the viewer moves their body and gets more intimate with the piece through the act of looking. They peek and turn to search for the, the photograph, but are ultimately denied all of the photographic information containing an image of my kin. I'm interested in this tension of concealing and revealing and finding other ways images. And this brings me to the end of my talk. Thank you to the Alaska Photographic Center for inviting me to share more about my art practice. And thank you to each of you for sharing your evening with me. 
Um, thank you all for being patient with the technical difficulties as well and getting this talk started. Now that I'm back in Alaska, I hope to connect with more folks in Alaska's photography community. And I'm not sure if there was any time for Q and A. Yeah, there's definitely time for Q and A. Okay. Folks should be able to unmute themselves at this point. So uh, if you have a question, feel free to put it in the chat or uh, unmute yourself and, uh, any questions? Cool. Thank you so much. Perfect. No questions. I'm off the hook. Pretty easy then. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Jenny. Uh, that's, yeah, thanks. That was, that was really great. It was nice to see your journey from you know, being a young person photographer in the 90s all the way to the present. Yeah, thanks. See it, the trajectory. Thank you. <clears throat> no, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Mike. Go ahead. No, I'm done. Go ahead. I, I just wanted to say thank you, Jenny. Um, I found your talk really fascinating. And uh, as, as Mike said, I've seen your work over the years and uh, I'm very impressed and uh, love the work and it's uh, very thought provoking. So thank you for making the effort and taking the time to do this for us tonight. I have so a much, question. Petra. It's good to see you and hear you. And you. May I ask a question? I got a question. Can, can you hear? It. Ah, okay. Um, how long will you be at the Benel Street? Is, uh, is that weeks or a month or? Uh, it's a three week residency and I have one week left. Ah, okay. Yeah. And also I'm exhibiting a sequence of where the right now. So you have an exhibition there currently showing? Yes. And and will that be up for a while? The, the reason I ask is I'll I'll be in Homer soon. I don't know if I'll be there during the time you're there, but will your exhibit be on display for for a bit? Uh, it it may come down on on the day I leave, depending if I take the work with me, or it may stay up until the end of the month. But definitely not longer until the end of April. All right. Yeah. Thanks. So hopefully there'll be a opportunity in the future, if not here in Homer. Are you are you thinking of doing any more publications? I would love to see that book, by the way, sometime. Uh, yeah, I think I definitely I think I have. Uh, I think there's like five copies left. Um, but yeah, I'll definitely uh, bring it. Um, yeah, I'm, I definitely love thinking about the book form and how it can be both um, a, a way to present a larger sequence or thinking about the medium of the book and how it can be, you know, it's an object it's also very intimate you can view it in anywhere you want you can hold it whereas you know photographs on a wall you can't hold um and uh, sometimes your the um, exhibition isn't accessible like um the the question that matt just asked is it going to be up for all like so work isn't always accessible whereas a book is most often accessible depending on uh, but there's something about the physicality of the book. And so where the tundra meets the ocean, I was able to play with some of these ideas of refusal, you know, thinking about how the spine of the book engulfs my great, my late great grandma and how the viewer is denied access to that information, to that photographic information of her um, and how uh, 
the white pages in the book can act as pauses or breaths, you know, similar to how we all install our work as photographers. Um, so I'm, I'm in the process of uh, creating a new book. So um, hopefully that will come. I mean, yeah, not hopefully, but uh, I'm really excited to work on that. Yeah, you know, I, I like what you said about the books because they they do they um, engage. I think all of your senses, you know, visually, they're mm. tactile. Um, they have a heft, a weight to them. When you turn the pages, there's a there, there's a sound that they make, and then I think yeah. I, I love to smell a book. I mean, that might be kind of weird, but you know, especially the fresh ink. I don't think you're alone in that. I also book. like to smell my photographs too. Okay. I think maybe yeah, other photographers would too. Or when you we used to walk into the dark room, you would smell the chemistry, and that got you in the mood for your your, yes. your work ahead. And I worked with a guy who was an engineer. Nothing wrong with that, I guess. But um, I, I like I like sketching with a pencil, you know, a number two pencil. And then when I sharpen it, it's even better because it has that fresh sharpened pencil smell. And I, I said, that gets me going. And he thought that was the most ridiculous thing he ever heard in his life. That how, how wow. would the smell of a sharpened pencil give you and get you in a different frame of mind than you should be anyway on the work site, you know, or something like that. But anyway, so I, I like what you said about the books. That's, that's all, that's true for me. Yeah. And, and then and so now you're working in sculpture, kind of, or at least wearable art. Or do you do you envision this cuss buck as, or I, I don't know. How do you how do you how do you see your process expanding from photography into three dimensional uh, works? Yeah, I think that's something that I had a really hard time with because I'm still so in love with the photograph and you know the photograph being a, a two like flat object on the wall um and really depending on the sizing and sequence and how that can really activate a space but with um the garment I see that as a photograph as well um you know it's a it's a garment and thinking about how my late great grandma is her hands and thinking about I was certain like um certain gestures of her hand in, in images. Um, and also thinking about um, hands play a big role in my work to begin with, but thinking about support connection and um, this garment, um, thinking about, um, you know, our garments also indicate gender. So trying to how to bring in this idea of like, not this idea, but bring in like, the garment and thinking about my late great grandma's um, hands if that's what I continue to work with as it's a work in progress um, me wearing the garment and her bringing me that strength and this form of connection um, so I don't know I, I just um, I I get an idea and then I just want to work with it. And I try not to think too much about um, what it has to be, I guess. Um, like I didn't go into that project thinking, okay, now I need to make it into like a wearable art sculpture. I was just thinking about our clothing and that archival image and um, thinking about working with the sun and the archival images being so important to me. Well, thank you. That, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, totally. Thanks for asking that, Mike. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen some really gorgeous stuff done with cyanotype on cloth and and then sewn into pieces into clothing. So I, I'm excited to see what you produce. Yeah, I 
I feel like I um, I entered into a very complex project and um, I just need to take it one step at a time. Mm -hmm. Do you think of yourself as a performance artist or do you have a that desire to perform at all? No, performance artist. Um, and the videos like that I showed you, I see those just moving pictures rather than like a movie. Um, and I, yeah, definitely not a performance artist artists even though you could say that like I'm performing now in an artist talk <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you? thanks I have a yeah. um so I, I found it really interesting uh what you were saying about kind of like denying people information which in one way that is kind of genius it's like that's the point of a making an interesting picture, I feel, but but also um, it kind of implies to me that you're sort of a private person. So I'm wondering if, because I'm a bit of a private person too, like how much do you, how do you gauge what you want to like share with people and how, like what you don't want people knowing? Yeah, that's such a good question. I'm constantly thinking about that. Um, but I'm also the biggest thing that I'm thinking about as a as an impact artist is like the history of photography and its relationship to the colonial project in the United States and really beyond the United States. Um, it was used as a tool, um, and Indigenous folks were documented. Um, the titles, you know, going through uh, public archives, looking at photographs of folks from the region I'm from, they were left nameless. And it was just like, you know, native woman, whereas uh, an image made during that time of like a settler gold miner, they had his full name and like where he was from. Um, so thinking about certain erasure in the history of photography and um you know yeah I, I i don't like to bring up this artist that or this person that much but we think about um i'm i'm not even going to name him but we think about this like idea of photographing people before a race dies out or something like that and um mm -hmm. I hope I'm making sense on that one. I, I think Jason knows who I'm talking about, but uh, um, uh, so photography as, as, as a tool to record. And so I'm very aware of how I use the tool and how I represent people within it. So my values as a photographer are always questioned and I'm always thinking about is this a story that I can tell? And like, so like going to New Mexico, it was really hard for me. I didn't go there and be like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna make a story about the, the land here. Because I was like, okay, I'm a guest. I know this land before I can make any work about it if I want to, uh, which I ended up not doing. Um, and those are just like my personal values. But um, I, I also think about like, access to information so um the i'm thinking about the gaze um and we specifically call it it's colonial gaze so thinking that you uh, everyone has to that visual information we have a right to that image we have a right to look at someone so i'm kind of withholding information to protect some of my family members and thinking about all those like um, the troubling history in, in the camera as a tool. So it's really hard for me to decide, okay, this is an image like that people are going to be able to see my late great grandma. But in those decisions, I also want folks to see indigenous joy, indigenous strength. And I don't have to like um, protect all the time, but there's certain moments where I feel like 
okay, I'm going to do a check. You don't get all of this information. And it's also within that tension. Maybe it will have, maybe the viewer will question, like, why do I feel like I have a right to see that information, that visual information? Yeah, that's a really good point. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for asking that question. So Jenny, thank you so much for your talk here. I, I really appreciate learning about your perspectives and, and and seeing these images and seeing the story and having you here to explain um, the the depth and profundity of, of, of a lot of these images is incredibly helpful. Um, you were talking about accessibility and um, accessibility uh, specifically to your work and I'm thinking of how hard that is to do in Alaska of all places um have you had the opportunity to show your work in um predominantly indigenous communities and and uh are are because I could see your work inspiring just a whole generation of of young photographers out there. I mean, photography is so, so wonderfully accessible now with, with smartphones yes. that, that people telling their own stories um, is really important and, and showing that that worth is, is really important. So anyways. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, I haven't shown too much in like rural Alaska, but um, it's been really nice even just being in, in Bunnell and Native folks come in and see my work and then pick on pick up on certain um, visual cues within the images and like instantly relate like an indigenous person from New Mexico was actually in town and came and she was able to like connect to some of the imagery of my late great grandma and think about like her family and so we just shared this really special conversation that I think the image prompt um and like she was able to just bring out a lot of things that I was thinking about while making the images or sequencing the work and you know just spending so much time with that work um so I felt that was really special but along your note like I um the Inuit Circumpolar Council of Alaska to Gamble and St. Michael to teach photo workshops for Inuit youth awesome. um, age and their youth definition is 18 to 35. So that was super incredible. So like me going to their home community and they also get a camera and they get to keep it from for completing the course. So that was just really special. And I hope more opportunities like that arise where I can go to communities and just like share some of my knowledge and hopefully inspire younger indigenous folks to well, you know, their iPhone and continue to share their own stories. And that was the goal of that project too from ICC. And I just feel very lucky that I got to be part of that. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Really? Any other questions? Mike, you're okay. <laughs> Thank I said thank you so much, Jenny. Uh, ah, yeah, yeah. That was really great. And uh, yes. I hope you uh, enjoy the rest of your time in Homer. Thank you so much. Yeah, it feels good to, I don't know about anyone else who's done an MFA program. You afterwards, you're kind of like, what? <laughs> How do I even get back to my practice? And you have to take a break for a while to like heal. And then, <laughs> and then, uh, I feel like I'm finally back into it and it feels good. And I think that being here was really helpful as well for that dive back into creating. But yeah, yeah thank you. 
thank you so much for inviting me. And again, thank you all for your patience with the technology, uh, the internet saga at the beginning. I'm really glad it worked out. Yeah, same here. Same here. Cool. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't know how to end it, but uh, it sounds <laughs> like we're we're good. We'll let you off the hook, but uh, we're all looking forward to seeing more of your work in the future. So, um, all right. Yes. Good good night, everybody. Thanks for Bye, coming. Bye, everyone. Good night, all. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Jenny. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.